Hey guys, welcome to the Joe Camo Show, a show featuring some of the top industry experts in their professional fields, talking about real life entrepreneurship and reality. Now, I'm transitioning four years into the fantasy football industry. I'm going to keep that going, but I wanted to create something for you guys, the sports listeners, something to talk about reality sports and have that realistic approach and bring in guests in their respective fields, not only just people in the sports industry, but doctors, engineers, anyone that helps and contributes to the sports industry. I wanted to bring that to you and add that unique, real feel to it. I felt that it was very limited with fantasy football, so I'm branching out here. This is the first episode, episode one of the Joe Camo Show, using my real name. Uh, actually, people say Joseph Robert is your real name. Well, Robert is actually my middle name, and I actually, it was my dad's name before he passed away, so I kind of used that as motivation to drive me to the fantasy football. Now I'm branching out. So episode one, and I want to tell you guys, episode one is very special me because I want to dig down to my roots. So I'm actually a martial arts practitioner, been doing it for years. Uh, started when I was about, I don't know, nine years old or something like that. It was Taekwondo. And I want to dig down to my roots and bring my old instructor. He's not old, but he's an instructor that uh, uh, it's, it's old for me because that's when I started. So my old instructor, uh, Lee Turner. Lee, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Joe. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you, man. And I wanted to, again, dig down to the roots here with this episode because it is the first episode. So I want to get get the nerves out. And, you know, kind of where I started with martial arts, it was kind of like, you know, your nerves are there, your kid, you're like, what do I do? And it's like, you were there as a mentor for me. So I just figure, I know that the show is going to be, you know, sky's the limit with the show. I think it's going to be a very special show. And I don't think a lot of people are really doing this to the degree I'm going to take this to. And I wanted to, to kick this off. I, I think there would be no better guest than, than, than a mentor of mine, a guy that's been practicing martial arts for years, a guy that's got, you know, a good mentality who I believe you meditate, you do a lot of things. So I'll let you talk about you because you know you better than me, but I know you're a mentor to me. And again, I'm digging to my roots to bring you in. What's going on? Hey, Joe. Um, thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. Um, you know, it's good to see you after all this time. Uh, when, uh, what I've been up to, I've just been training like I've always been doing. It's been an ongoing thing for my whole life, basically, my whole adult life. Uh, I've been a martial artist and I've been teaching martial arts and I'm still doing it now in Toronto, downtown. Yeah, I mean, I think you just have such an interesting story. I mean, did your when did your family immigrate here? Where did you guys originally come from? And you guys are in Canada now. By the way, just to let you know, as born and raised in Canada, uh, Lee currently lives in the Toronto area, I believe. So, can you just kind of give us a background of like when your parents immigrated, how that any adversities to that, and how you started getting into martial arts? Um, well, that's a, that's a long that's a long story. I'll give you that shorter version. But my my family's from Jamaica. Um, my mom, my dad and my two sisters and me. Um, I, everybody in my family was born in Jamaica, except me, I was born here in Canada. And, um, and my whole experience is as a, as a Canadian, a born in Canada, um, just growing up as a kid, not knowing about too much, you know, and then all of a sudden I experienced this, um, you know, just you know, getting picked on as a kid, trying to grow up and just find my roots and find out who I am, because my parents are, immigrated here so I'm just trying to figure my life out you know when you get bullies trying to beat you up and rough you up and take your lunch money things like that you know and I have to figure out how can I deal with what's happening here like you know these the same age as me but they may have different experiences so they kind of feel privileged in a way where they can start punching me and throwing me around and you know and if I fight back my parents would get mad at me they'd say the if, you, if you, you're gonna get in trouble you know if you get in trouble with your teacher you get um put in detention or whatever the worst part of it would be my parents my they, you know my parents being from Jamaica you know there's a belt issue or whatever could happen if we get in trouble so I was scared to fight basically to fight back when people bullied me but you're a big guy aren't you like you're a tall guy you're strong when I met you I don't know when I met you probably in your 20s but you were a big strong dude who would want to mess with you I mean you look physically capable right who was who was messing with Lee Turner well, I, I thought I was bigger than I was. My sister tells me that I was really small and skinny and tiny. And they couldn't understand how, they said I was, I was scared and fearful. You know, if someone came up to me, you know, I wouldn't, they didn't, they didn't see me as someone that was going to beat everybody up. But right. in my mind, 
I was scared that I was going to hurt the person. So I would kind of, I didn't want to fight because I was scared I would hurt them or that my parents would get mad at me. So I tried to disengage and not fight type of thing until it went down, until I finally did get in the fight. And then my parents, I got in other fights, but when I got in a big fight one day, um, I came home with blood all over my clothes. My mom's like, what happened? And then um, my dad says, did you get in a fight? I said, yeah, I got in a fight. My dad said, did you win? And I said, yeah, I won. He said, okay, I'm going to have to put you in martial arts now because sometimes you have to learn to fight to learn not to fight. Right. I mean, now it's a little bit changed now. Bullying is a little bit more cracked down on in modern day. But yeah, even when I was a kid, I was the chubby, I was a chubby fat kid. Uh, but I think maybe you met me when I was a chubby fat kid. And then <laughs> I, I kind of leaned out. But uh, yeah, I was picked on. And, you know, my last name is Camus. So they say canoe and they say, how come canoes can float and you can't? You sink to the bottom. And I've been, yeah. you know, I was called all the names. Yeah, yeah, this is real stuff. So I found myself fighting in elementary school. And I think it kind of fizzled out in uh, in high school a little bit. But I think, isn't that one of the main factors that drives people to martial arts? Do you think it is? Uh, well, you know more than me because you've trained a lot of people. Is a big factor of it bullying? Does that drive people? Or is it physical fitness? What is the main draw to martial arts these days? Well, martial arts, we say martial arts, you mean, um, we're not even talking about what's up, tra traditional martial arts, not MMA. Anything, right? so, anything, anything that makes you want to engineer and, and create a body that, that can defend itself and also get into fighting shape, shape. just because you, again, there's this whole stigma like, oh, I train or whatever. I got to do a fight. No, some people I think just want to do it for physical fitness. But what do you find from your clients? Are they just people that are just kind of wanting to get back in shape or is it more just like, hey, I was bullied and, and like I want to protect myself. I walk into bars. It's just females that just feel a little bit insecure if a male. Uh, approaches them when they're walking down the street, and you know, like, are they just there to protect? Like, what is the kind of the majority? I mean, I'm assuming it's a mix of stuff, right? Well, most people don't really, they don't, they usually come in trying to get in shape. For me, right now in downtown Toronto, people come in trying to get in shape. But then along the way, they start to realize that, oh, I have this newfound strength, I have this newfound power, what should I do with it? And they start thinking about things that happen to them in their life. Um, most people have been in some kind of assault, attempted assault situation, potential assault situation. So they, they, they put it in the back of their mind and don't think about it. But every once in a while it comes up and they have to think, you know, I should learn techniques to defend myself. So when you start to get strong, you start thinking about other things. Like your base is always, you know, security. That's the, most, the number one thing that we need to have secure is our, to know that we're not going to get injured. We're not, we have a roof over our head, you know, we're secure. But as soon as we feel like there's, um, there's a potential for danger, right, then we need to know, we need to find a way to, to bring our security back. So people go to martial artists to find security in their lives because they're they're insecure yeah that's a good point point. and so what are you doing right now do you train do you do private sessions and what type of styles are you teaching are you holding the bag for people or the pads for people are you teaching like styles like krav maga what type of styles do you teach and what type of styles do you think are important to meet the needs of self-defense in, in the modern day? Because again, now that you've got weapons to deal with, you got more things. I don't think there's uh, something they call a fair fight anymore. Uh, yeah, so sure. yeah, and again, if anything happens, I think it's a little bit like you see, I don't know who it was. It was that Rick Moranis guy. Remember Rick Moranis, the guy from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Remember that actor? Back right. in the 80s? Yep. He was in Ghostbusters. Apparently he was walking yeah. in New York. This is months ago, months and months ago, but I read the story and he got walking down the street. Someone sucker punched him. Like anything can happen on the street, right? You just So how do you prepare for life's challenges when there's so much uncertainty and any you get blindsided from, you know what I mean? So how do you prote right. protect that? Are you always on guard or, uh, you know, it depends on obviously what neighborhood you're in, right? You don't want to be going in, you want to avoid those situations. That was rule number one. I think you taught me, in, that's right in, when i was young right that's right <laughs> that's exactly you just answered it avoidance so instead of um def learning to defend against every possible situation you basically you try to grow the human you know strengthen the human being mind body spiritually strong and then whatever comes your way at least you can have confidence in your ability to deal with situations because in the training that's what you come up against opposition so once you learn to deal with opposition in in your training in real life that'll carry over. So we're trying to create techniques that can cross over into your everyday life. You know, when you start training long enough, you start to see it as a microcosm, a small, like the small represented in the big. So things that you learn in class are things that you can take and apply into everyday life. So if you learn to be aware in class, you know, um, they teach you in class. If, if in cl you're in class and at any time someone's going to attack you, there's nothing you can do about it. When you're on the street, you're going to walk with a different kind of awareness because in class you're training for that type of thing. 
So people that are trained are definitely more aware. A situational awareness and body awareness, if somebody touches you, you know, you can turn around and punch them in the head or you can turn around and look to see who it is. Right. You know, someone that's too tense might just punch somebody and someone and it might be an old person asking you to give them directions or something like that. So we also right. have to keep our mind relaxed and calm and be able to, you know, just um, evaluate a situation and assess and avoid if possible. And even then, if it's a bad situation, you don't have to escalate all the way and kill somebody. You can just, you know, let them know that they could escalate further and they might back down. Yeah, I've always wanted to get into Krav Maga. I think that's a great style to defend yourself, but that's a ruthless uh, style. Isn't that like an Israeli style of martial art? Are you familiar with Krav Maga and have you practiced it? I've never practiced it. I know of it. I've seen, you know, I've seen YouTube, things like that. Um, and very deadly, very dangerous. It's known as one of the most dangerous martial arts, you know, weapons. It's just dangerous. Like for here, do you need that? It's everything you know is good. It's knowledge is power. So there's nothing that you should not learn. I don't, I don't believe there's anything that you shouldn't learn. Learn it all. But stick to one system. It's good to have a base in one style and then add on in different ways instead of learning a little bit of everything. You know, jack of all trades, master of none, that type of thing. What would you rather have? What would you rather have, Joe? What, for, for a fighting style? Would you rather have one base, be really good at one thing, and then learn everything else to add on? Would you rather, or would you rather be good? Would you rather be good at everything? A little bit half decent at everything and not really good in one area. No, I think you should have a foundation in something and then you could just stack on top of that. For me, like I said, with this podcast I started with fantasy football, had I not done four years of fantasy football, I wouldn't have been able to branch out and hold an intelligent conversation with you the way that I have. I've done a lot of research into interviewing and how to conduct a podcast and how to do the editing. I feel that if I didn't build my foundation in fantasy for four years, I wouldn't be able to branch out to something. Like that. I know it's a, not the greatest example, but yeah, I think you definitely need a foundation. And then on top of that, you can definitely build. Um, and there's an ongoing joke I always do with my wife and my friends. They kind of get annoyed with it. I say, who would win in a fight? I kind of always do that. So I want to branch off here. And then we're going to talk about health and fitness at the end. Cause I want to pick your brain. Cause you're kind of like a vampire, literally. I mean, you look just as good as you did like 20 years ago. So we want to know your secrets. And that's kind of one of my focuses for the show is I want to bring value to people. I want people to be aware uh, of their physical fitness. Cause I think a lot of people lack that or they're just, it's a mental game, right? Because it's getting up and getting out and doing that workout. So I want to talk a little bit about your secrets uh, near the end, but I want to talk about who wins in a fight. I want to have a little bit of a goat debate here uh, <laughs> with uh, who the greatest UFC fighter is right now. And your opinion is, is very valued in this because you've been around martial arts for such a long time. So again, the ongoing joke is who would win the fight. So, I got one for you, uh, a, a Krav Maga guy. Now, if you guys aren't aware of the military Israeli fighting style, it's very ruthless. It's like punch you in the throat, kick you in the nuts, bite your head off, bite your ear off, bite your nose off. It's it's ruthless. So I got to ask you, a fully trained Krav Maga guy ends up with a guy, let's say like Khabib from the UFC. They go toe to toe. How would it, how would a trained top-notch UFC fighter, a guy like Bones Jones, I mean, these guys are well-versed in kickboxing, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. They're well-versed in all aspects of the fighting game. Their body is a lethal weapon. Their cardio is probably top-notch. You know, it's it's next-gen. And you've got this, this Krav Maga guy who's been trained for 15 years that'll bite your ear off and kick you in the nuts and just elbow you in the eye, and he doesn't care. He'll gouge your eye out. I know it's a hypothetical question, but let's have some fun. We're talking martial arts here. Why not? How would how would Bones Jones do against a crazy uh, military uh, Krav Maga guy? I, I want to I want can you break this down? Yeah, he would lose. <laughs> who who would lose? He, Bones Jones would definitely no chance. Only because it's like um, I see it like this. I see if you put a pit bull yeah against a wolf right, who wins? Well, it depends on where they are. Are they in a are they in a pit or are they in the forest? Because they're in the forest, then the wolf's gonna win because the wolf. The wolf knows the forest oh, better, gosh. right? And the pit, the pit bull wins. But the pit doesn't really exist. The pit is like a creation. Right. But in the forest, that's that's from nature. So the wolf is gonna, in its natural habitat, it's gonna be able to, you know, it's gonna win. It's gonna be able to use the environment for to to win. That's a good analogy. I should have been a little more specific. So yeah, in the octagon with the rules, yes, Bones Jones crushes this guy. But on the street, if their life depends on it you know, then you've got a situation where the Krav Maga guy has a significant advantage. Don't you agree? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, we talk he, about, he trains for it. 
Can you explain? I, I'm really going to test you here because, again, there's no better person to test when it comes to martial arts and understanding the fundamentals. Let's talk a little bit about fight or flight, okay? Now, let's just say if I'm – is this born and innate? Is this something that someone's born to be a flight person? Is it someone that's, you know, born to fight? Like, let's just say I'm a timid guy and I naturally gravitate towards flight and I want to – you know, fly away from the situation, but I'm put in a situation where God forbid my family is at risk, then I got to fight. Right. So when is it the, the, the natural instinct kicks in? Can that kick into anybody? Like if their life depends on it, do you find, or do you find that a timid guy will just be a timid guy under all circumstances? Just kind of want to get your idea, ideology and thought process behind fight or flight. Is it something we're born with or how does it, how does it, or something we're learned? Well, that's a great question. Um, I can just speak from experience. I think if you put the organism or put the human into a situation, they're going to adapt. The situation that they don't die from, they're going to adapt. Even if they believe that they're going to die, they're going to adapt. You know, so you get used to it. You get used to that type of thing. So, you, you know, maybe the first time, oh, oh see, if, you see, if you see a dog or a lion right. and, you want to, and you want to run, something tells you to run. But then something else tells you not to run because if you run, it's going to chase you down and, and kill you, basically. Right. So you know you so you know you can't run. You got to stand your ground. Everything tells you to run, but you're not going to run because if you stand your ground, maybe it'll back down and leave you alone. So you choose the second option instead of what your body and your mind and whatever that place that you go to tells you to do. You don't go with that. So it's your intellect. It's intellect. Right. Can, can um it can overpower the spider flight sometimes. Right. So, told- so you got a super timid guy and someone breaks into his house and he's super timid. There's a chance that he could retreat to that timid thing, to personality, that timid trait. Or do you, so or he, most 90 percent chance, most likely he's probably going to fight to survive, I would say. Right. No, no. If he, if he thinks he has a way out, if he feels he has a way out, is it like he can out. hide? Is if he feels he can hide and, and um, stay undetected? Right. Then maybe he's going to do that. But then as soon as it, it, there's a turning point when there come, becomes a real, this is going to fight. Everyone thinks they're the hunter. Then you realize that you're the hunted. So once they realize that, that they can't hide and they're going to be discovered, they come to a conclusion within their brain that they're going to have to turn the tables and seize the advantage, which means to attack first, attack first and attack with surprise to, to end this conflict. It's so a conclusion survival, that instincts, have. survival instincts kick in one way or another to, to help you survive is what you're saying. And I agree with that. Right. It's like if I put you in a if I put you in a an arm bar or a shoulder lock, and you know that I'm gonna break it. Yeah, like, tap I out. keep putting pressure. And I keep putting pressure though. I keep putting pressure. I don't stop putting pressure. And you're like, oh my god, he's gonna break my arm. What are you gonna do? Are tap you gonna out. just? <laughs> but then I, what if I keep going though? Oh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna bite you. I'm gonna do I, whatever it takes. Whatever. Right. Right. I'm gonna find so a way. Was, grab a weapon. So tap, I grab a rock. So tapping out, what are you saying, Joe? Is tapping out is not your last option? Um, you know, I if it was in a gym and we're practicing, I'd probably tap out just but if it was a street fight, I'd find another way. I'd slip out, I'd find a rock, I'd you know, I'll find a projectile, I would throw something at your face for sure. So you saying so you're saying these moves don't work. These moves don't work unless you let it unless you let it work. There's a, there's a there's a way out. There's another way out besides going with the move that they're doing. Well, I think what would happen, you know, let's just say I couldn't get on, you break it, I would, you know, I'd pull my arm out and fight with my left arm, right? If you had my right arm, right? But I'm talking about that moment before the, before it breaks, where you have just a second of, where you can just kind of do a slip. You can just pull that last second, that last second right. before it's, you can't come back. So what are you that saying? Second. What, what are you saying? What do I do in that state? I'm saying if you put somebody in that situation where they have no option but to fight back, they will. Because yeah. that's the only, right, and it's and if the other only if the only other option is death, then they will fight back with everything they have. That's like Sun Tzu. That's some Sun Tzu right there. Correct. I, I think so. I think so as well. I think they'll definitely fight back. Um, so yeah, I don't want to. I want to get. I want to switch over here real quick to the goat talk. Um, let's talk about it. Khabib having an amazing twenty nine and zero uh, record Ooh. and. This is a big debate because Bones Jones, I think, came out on social media and said something along the line. Like he he's not obviously not happy with this. But then there's this whole debate that 
and I don't know. So I'm not going to talk about stuff I don't know factually. So right. I, I want to tell you, there is rumors that he was on performance enhancing drugs, like right. steroids, stuff like that. I don't I don't know for sure. I think it's been proven. I don't, I, I don't know if you know anything about that. Maybe you can right. chime in. Uh, that could be part of the, the debates here. And then you've got GSP, a guy that's defended his title, I think, more times than Khabib. But Khabib, almost flawless. And every round I think he's ever been in, I think he's dominated. So you yeah. got this, you know, goat debate in MMA, it's a tough one. And then you've got some of the pioneers back in the day, like, you know, Chuck Liddell, you know, guys like that, that were really good back in the day. And you've got Anderson Silva, who's still fighting. But then again, we're going to talk about this as well, about the body and stuff like that. I think Khabib is, you know, retiring technically when he's kind of up here, whereas Anderson Silva, he's kind of just stretching it. A lot of athletes do this, like Adrian Peterson in football. The guy's past his prime, but he's still playing, but he's not playing on the peak level. So, I mean, goat debate. I mean, who is the goat of MMA? I know it's a tough question to answer. What are your thoughts on this? So, as far as Joseph, as far as the goat goes, Fedor is my number one. That's my favorite because I watched Fedor back in the day, and he beat up Nagira. Nagira was on top with jiu-jitsu. He was the number one, number one fighter, world champion, um, one of the best jiu-jitsu practitioners we had ever seen up to that moment, and then there was this Russian Fedor that showed up and just beat him up so bad. Didn't respect his guard, dove through his guard, punched him. Every move that uh, Nagura put on him, Fedor would get out of every single move. He's my favorite and he kept doing it to top fighters for a long time. Um, besides that, if you want to talk, speak about currently, the current, the current um, Habib did great. He's a great fighter. I love everything that he does. I haven't seen him fight enough. Though. I haven't seen him fight enough jujitsu people in my mind. Right. I want to see somebody resist him on the ground. I haven't seen anybody give him any resistance on the ground except Conor McGregor. Yeah, why is it that he's so dominative on the ground? I mean, yes, he's got great wrestling, but these are top-notch, top-10 fighters, yet every time they're on their back, on the ground with him, he manages to get that control, and they're all looking up at the clock wondering when the round is over. Why are they so submissive to him on the ground? Is it just that he's just completely overpowering? And then I don't I want to, it's a two part question. And if you are that weak on the ground and you know that Khabib is stronger than you, why are you not grappling guys that are 280 pounds and having them lay on you 10 hours a day until you get out of it? Like, what is the problem here? Why is he that good? Is it just his body? He's just that good in, in controlling them on the ground? Yeah, he's that, he's that good. He's like perfect. It's from that bear. He used to train with a bear yeah. in Russia. I saw the video. Um, I watched his moves, and he was a little kid when he did it, and all his moves were just, he unders, he gets it. The way a bear would understand it is the way that he gets it. It's in his body. When he grabs on, they've never been gripped that strongly before. It's amazing how he does it. Um, I don't think that he's went against the top. I haven't seen him go against the top jiu-jitsu guy with a bottom game that could resist those moves, though. So everybody tries to get out. Everyone tries to run. And then that's part of his game is to maul you. So when you run... He kind of lets you run, then he grabs on and drags you down again, then lets you run, drags you, drags you down again. But no one really stayed there and tried to be comfortable on the ground and fight him that way, which is what jujitsu, a top level jujitsu practitioner would do. Right. But so we don't know. He left questions unanswered. Bones Jones, we know what he's going to do. We've seen him in every situation. We've seen how he reacts to every situation. Fedor, we've seen him in every situation. See how he reacts to every situation. GSP. We've seen him in every situation, how he reacts, but we've never seen Habib on the ground, on his back. We've only seen him do it this one time on his back, and we've right. never seen somebody resist him on their back on the ground. I would, say, I would say it's safe to say that he retired too prematurely to consider him the actual GOAT, in my opinion. I still think there's more title defenses to be had. I think there's more to be seen. I kind of agree with that. I mean, GSP's got to be in conversation, too, a fellow Canadian of yours. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> GSP. GSP, yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, he's, he's the top. He's one of the top ones. He's got to be the top one. Um, modern. Like, him and Fedor. Uh, I can't, there's nothing I can say about GSP. I think GSP would beat Habib. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be a good fight. That would be a dream fight. In his GSP in his prime, you know. But but we've yeah. seen GSP lose to Matsara. Remember the last time he lost to Matsara? <laughs> <laughs> I did not mean to lose to Matsara. I can't do the accent very well, but he just got caught, right? So that was a pretty good accent. Yeah, not but, bad. I've been working on it. I've been watching him for a long time. 
<laughs> but Matt Serum, that was a mistake. That was an accident. Um, GSP's got that long. GSP fights the same kind of style that we used to fight back in the day with the point fighting. He's, he's, yeah. he, he was doing the same thing over in Quebec, but he's got that long jab and he's got long kicks that reach right. from a long distance and that point fighting style where it's hard to really, nobody beats him up with their hands. Nobody, nobody's better than him with their hands or feet. Like standing, there's nobody better than him. Nobody beat him up standing. Even Nick Diaz, like nobody beat him up standing. And so it'd be jab against jab and his jab's longer. Right. So he would beat Habib with that super long jab he has. Then we kick his feet punch. out. Superman yeah. punch, remember that? Yeah, that kind of thing. And then we kick, you sweep, you kick his feet out, and Habib wouldn't be able to get close enough to GSP to take him down. I don't think. And then he'd beat him up on his feet. So if like if, if I'm simulating this, so if you got, let's say, Khabib comes in, he's putting pressure on GSP. What is GSP doing at this point in this simulation? So I would imagine he's kind of backing up, moving around, striking, keeping him away with the jab. And the cool thing is, if Khabib manages to take down GSP, no problem. But I think GSP is elusive enough, and he could sprawl out of any possible takedown from Khabib. Am I right? Like, how, how would this play out? Well, G um, I don't think Khabib would get close enough because if they both do a jab, GSP's got the longer reach, so his jab would cancel out Khabib's jab. And then Habib would try to come in closer and and GSP would do the sprawl, but Habib might grab a leg or whatever. He grabs a leg, then it's game over. But GSP's sprawl is so crazy in the way he gets back up. Remember that super sprawl that he does where yeah. he kind of flies in the air like Superman, yeah. drops down and gets, like, it's amazing. He does it all in one move. So I don't see how, like, Habib would probably find a way around that, maybe get a hold of him eventually. But uh, I don't know. GSP might be able to, I don't know. I don't know yep. if, if, if it gets st stood up enough times. I don't think Habib, if Habib got GSP on the ground in that same against the fence like everybody else, that'd be it. He was a bye genetic bye. freak. He was, he was a freak, that guy. George St. Pierre, I mean, the genetics, the fast twitch muscle, he had, he had all the in, like intangibles. It was, it was unbelievable how great that was. Then he's perfectly trained. He's an unbelievable athlete. That and, he, and he was smart, too. He's smart. Yeah, he's smarter than those other guys. He trained with all all the top like in kickboxing, the top kickboxing, the top jujitsu guys, the top fighters, and every art that he trained. And he found the top guy, the world champion, to train with that guy. So he's yeah. seen everything, except for the Habib. If Habib fights against the fence, GSP, I don't, I haven't seen him with any kind of superiority against <laughs> that style of attack. So I don't know what he would do there. Do you think and Habib the, gets everybody there? So the la the last fight, do you think Habib? Do you think the loss of his dad motivated him even more? Do you think that does that for me? It's a driver losing my dad. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Do you think it more drove him to win, or do you think it was more kind of hindering him and kind of made him a little more emotional? Do you think it it, it was an advantage or a disadvantage to lose his dad in that particular fight emotionally? Why emotional wise? Well, I think for him, for Habib, I think it made him. I don't think it really, it just added to his legacy. To him, right. he's just like, this will just add to my, like that cold kind of Russian, this will just add to my legacy. But I, I don't think he's cold, but I think that he can differentiate between his emotions and how he's feeling and what's actually happening in the moment. So I don't think it affects him like how it might affect some people. Habib's different. Um, he's, he's known it his whole life. Without his dad there, he might feel sorry and feel lost, but he's, I don't think it would affect him. And then, and then he closed it, you know, he closed it after that when he was crying and, you know, so, and then he said he's not going to fight anymore and nobody knew that he wasn't going to fight anymore. That might have been a, he might have just done that on the spot. Just like, you know what, this is it. I didn't know if I could fight without my dad being there, but now I just did it. And now there's no more questions. I know I can, that might have just been the one that let him know who he is. When he says he knows himself, right. now he, maybe he really does know himself now. Yeah, definitely cemented his legacy. So I want to dive a little bit deeper here into the fighter's mind, okay? Um, and again, I'm really, really testing you today. All those years of experience, I'm putting it to the test here. Um, That's good. What do you think is that point? What is that pivot point for a, a player or a fighter, right? Or a guy, just like an average guy to say, hey, I want to fight now. Is it the story? Is, the, is it the underdog story? Is it poverty? Is it... Uh, bullying. We talked a little bit about this, why you want to get into martial arts, but what is the main history of most of these fighters? Like, I don't think GSP, was, I think he's just an athletic guy, the gymnastics, right? A majority, if you were to describe it, what provokes these guys to become fighters and particularly UFC fighters in your opinion? Money. Yeah. All money. It's all for the money. Nobody wants to fight. Nobody wants to get their ass kicked. It's not fun. 
you know nobody nobody wants to do it for no no reward all risk no reward it's never fun so everybody just wants the money and as the money increases to get better and better athletes start to come into mma that is real athletes because yeah. I, I did it for the wrong reason. And, and money shouldn't just be your driver. It should be passion. It should be hard. It should be, I think it should be more of a purpose. Because for me, it was just like, oh, I want the money. I want the fame. I did MMA. Then I realized getting punched in the face isn't fun. I did it for four years and I forced myself. And it made me feel uncomfortable being in, I, tried, I had two MMA fights. I was one for one, nothing great. But I, nice. I got in there, right? It, the, the, the feeling of it is just raw. Like it just feels very raw. And I remember, you know, it was my second fight. I got hit and I and I got knocked out. He got me in the back of my my head here, kind of like behind the ear. I kind of dropped. I didn't even know. I just fell, right? It just because I'm like get clipped, right? And then uh, after coming out of that, the doctors checked me. He's like, what day it is? And I remember the day. It was April 23rd. But he's like, what day is it today? I'm like, is it May 2 4? And it was like, I was I was out of it, right? And I just didn't like that feeling of losing control. And But to, you know, and again, I was in for the wrong reason. So that is a good point. I think a lot of people are driven by, oh, I want my hands up. I want the legacy. I want the money. And maybe yeah. that is the wrong reason. But what is the right reason? Is it just, what is the right reason to fight in the UFC? Really? It's a tough question. Well, I don't know about UFC, but in, in the amateurs, it's good for just self-improvement. You know, you get to you find something out about yourself. You know, all all young people should should do martial arts for that reason. Yeah. Like amateur, not pro, where someone's right. trying to, you know, they harm you, the intent is to do harm, but just amateur where you can just see who see who kind of who's dominant, you know, who has it, who has it that day. You know, we're not trying to kill each other, but you're just trying to sharpen each other, you know, steel sharpen steel. So you need to be around people similar to you so you can sharpen your knife and see how good you can get. You owe it to yourself, you owe it to the other person to test them to see how good each other can get and what the human potential is. How far can we get as human beings? Like what does the ultimate human being look like? What does the ultimate fighter actually look like? Are these fighters and the ultimate fighter the actually best fighters? Like, is that what the ultimate expression of the human body is, what you see in ultimate fighting? Like the greatest fighter, out of the, if you put your imagination, the greatest fighter and put the greatest fighter together, would they be fighting in the same style that the UFC is using? Is that actually the greatest style to defeat another human being? I would think I'd be a Spartan. I'd have swords and shields and I'd go at it. I don't know. It's, it's, so, <laughs> that's a good question. How, but how about empty hands? Like no weapons. Oh, yeah. I'd go, bare knuckle. I'd go bare knuckle. No rules, obviously. Kick him in the groin. I Krav Maga style. Just two, two guys. Just throw them in there. No but what would it look like? Would it look like Krav Maga? It would look like UFC 1. That's what it would look like. <laughs> That's what it would look like. I mean, yeah. like, seriously, you have the sumo wrestler versus the, the other guy. Who was the guy? The, the kickboxing guy. Remember when he just kicked the teeth out of the sumo wrestlers? That's what that's a fight, right? And yeah. I think they just kind of get more constraints and more more limitations. And I think, to be honest, I, I've always talked to us and I always thought thought about this. I think there should be no weight class to some degree. If I I want to be the best fighter in the world, I want to say I'm the best fighter. I should be. I don't care if I'm 135 pounds. I want to be the best fighter in the world. Give me Bones Jones. You know, give me Brock Lesnar. Whoever was the the, the champion at the time, Khabib. If he wants to be the best best fighter in the world, go take on a heavyweight. Why Why should you be limited to weight class? I understand for safety reasons, and and again, it's a sport. It's it's a money making. It's a machine. But wouldn't it be cool to have no weight class, or is that just not fair? Be honest. Like it's probably not fair, right? Well, what happened was in the back, in the beginning of the yeah. UFC when Hoist Gracie was dominant, the Gracie style of jiu-jitsu was designed to um, slow cook people. Right. You know, so you didn't need you don't want time limits because what you want to do is slow cook them. You know, you just tire them out so they can't move. You tire <laughs> out the biggest person, get the biggest gorilla, and just tire them out so they can't move. They don't want to move anymore, and then they turn into you know they're not the same anymore. Dan Severin, yeah. Right? Then you can do whatever you want. They say everybody's a coward when when fatigue sets in. Right. So that their whole style was based on that. So when they took out the time limits, they, they started losing because their best part of their fighting was the timing that they used. Yeah. Yeah, everything was timed, and I, I kind of like the just throw throw these guys in there and just hope for the best and stomp on their head. Do you remember that? They're stomp on each other. and stomp on them. But then they realize that if you just wrap somebody up, then none of that works anymore. Right. right? But if you look at um, I, I looked, I researched into some African martial arts, um, and I realized that all the fighting was they never did any, they didn't do too much jujitsu style of fighting because everybody had a knife. So when you hit the ground, you're dead, yeah. basically. So they didn't really, so, so, so like Capoeira and martial arts like that, 
where you don't actually, if your body touches the ground, then it's, then it's basically, it's over because if, if it's a simulation yeah. and they had a knife, you'd be dead now. Oh yeah. So your whole style, so for any kind of fighting really that involves rolling on the ground is not real fighting technically because if someone has a knife, then that none of it works anymore. All right, let's, let's kick it back here, old school. Let's have some fun here. Who would win the fight? This is a good one for you. Who would win the fight? You ready for this one? In their prime, Steven Seagal or Van Damme? <laughs> That's a good one for you. Steven Seagal. Um, Steven, Steven Seagal was, uh, he was, he was in Japan teaching yeah. Aikido. Tall white guy in Japan teaching Aikido, and they, they didn't like him, and they'd go up, they'd go up, knock on his door, and call him out, and he'd come out and fight them. <laughs> but I heard he turned down a fight from Van Dam. There was a stream where they were at a club and Van Dam called him out. I don't know if that's true. I heard something. That like might that. be true, but that's just hype. You know, <laughs> closed doors, closed doors, nobody's there. Two of them against Van Dam's fast and everything else, but Seagal is um he's got lots of luck. If he gets his hands on him, if you got his hands, like Van Dam's not gonna do those flying kicks. So Steven Seagal gets his hands on him, touch that Aikido, starts chop breaking up his bones. That's it. That's it. How would, how would uh, if you guys, uh, some of the old school guys that, that are old enough to remember, Frank Dukes, how would he hold up in the UFC? <laughs> you know what I mean? If he had a ground game. Remember Frank Dukes' blood sport? Yeah. All you guys remember? He's an yeah. over-the-top martial artist. Van Damme played him in a 1989 movie that's a classic. It's a lot of cheesy one-liners like, okay, USA, if you guys remember that movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How would, how would Van, this is, I'm, I know we're going off on a tangent, but I'm just having some fun here. How would Jean Claude Van Damme, aka Frank Dukes, hold up in the UFC if he had learned a ground game? Because he was—he had the death touch. You remember, like he used to break the bottom the brick. bricks. Yeah. He used to fight blindfolded. I, I mean, this guy was the uh, the 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 pinnacle of what a a, a a cage fighter. But there's no cage in that fight. A blood sport fighter would be. So how would he hold up in the UFC? You think? He gets. That's a good question. Right? <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. You know when you um. Aura of invincibility, right? When, you, when you're on a roll, you're on fire, and people yeah. know that you're on fire subliminally in their mind. They don't think they can beat you, so they can't beat you type of thing. Khabib and Gaethje is an example of that. I think, Ga I think Gaethje out, psyched himself out. Yeah. 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 That's what would happen. It'd be a subliminal thing where... This is, Frank, yeah. this is Bruce Lee. This is Frank Dukes. This is like the legend, right? They might get a little intimidated, maybe. They, they might be intimidated. Once they see him... Once they see um, what he can do with the coconuts. <laughs> or the, the tree where he's chopped down the tree with the, the palm yeah. trees with his, with his shin. Who wants to fight that guy? Who wants to fight the guy that's, that's, uh, that's uh, wrestling with a bear? That type yeah. of thing. So if you can get to the point where you can show somebody something amazing, right? And then you stand across them in the ring, they might just subliminally let you win. I'm not saying anybody in the UFC would do that, but I'm just saying if someone comes in on fire like that, then like I've seen people, fighters come into the UFC on fire. Right. What's the one guy? I think Chimeyev, the Russian guy. He's on fire. He's, he fight. He fights and then he fights again. Two fights in a row. Um, no one's ever done it before. He keeps. He, he's fighting all the time. He's looking for his next fight. It's intimidating. Nobody wants to fight him because they're because he has. He's on a roll. You know. Once you're on a roll, if you can show people that you're on a roll, that you're that you have this much momentum behind you, it's hard. It's hard to beat someone like that. It's psychological that a lot of it is psychological. I'll share a quick story here. I was actually doing MMA. I was one one. I wanted to get back into it. This is where I was kind of uncertain whether I wanted to do it. So I set up to fight this guy. It was an amateur fight, and I went, to, I think it was in Detroit or somewhere like that. So apparently, this guy, somehow I saw him on Facebook. At the, this was years ago when fa Facebook was still good, big, but it wasn't as big now. He didn't have an Instagram, but he was holding up this like big, those big dogs. I can't remember the name of it. It wasn't a Greyhound. It was, I can't remember the name. Those big dogs. Mastiff. Mastiff. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. He's holding up this Mastiff and he's flexing. He's a big guy, right? So, I, I part of my mind I, he's not doing it he's just holding a dog but he looked like a mean dude right so part of me was like oh my god this guy looks like a mean dude you know I, it was just in the back of my mind you know coincidentally like it was just weird i got injured i had a quadratic contusion a guy kicked me in my quad it was swallowed i couldn't walk like a couple days before the fight so i had to pull out of this fight so i went to the fight anyway and i met the guy and he because i had a shaved head at the time i looked i was pretty ripped at the time i kind of looked mean too in some of my pictures he actually said that he's glad that I pulled out because he was actually intimidated by me. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And I was kind of intimidated by you holding that. I mean, holding a Mastiff isn't intimidating, but he had other pictures where he was kind of, he looked intimidating, right? So right. it's funny right. that he was actually intimidated of me. So that kind of goes to your point that 
it is psychological, a lot of it. Yes, yes. So, so yeah, I want to kind of uh, wrap this up here. I just want to talk a little bit about um, just society and like uh, the instincts for, for fighting. Because for example, I read this, I was listening to this motivational thing. I listen to motivational stuff all the time. And uh, the, in this in this motivational track, it's it's a it's a soundtrack with this like Coliseum music, and it's like the guy's talking, and he says, "When we're born, we're kicking and screaming, and we come out, and we're crying, and we we've got this instinct." And I'm watching my three year old daughter, and I'm watching my son, and they're just having fun, and they're kind of fearless, and the and the son crawls up on the couch, and he like he doesn't care that he could fall three feet over. We gotta hold him. Hey, ease up, right? So. Do you find that society as a whole, put your hand up, sit in class, stand in line? I know there's got to be a way to organize people. We don't want people out of control. But do you think that limits our fighting nature, that screaming out as a kid? Do you think it hinders us? Because I feel that without martial arts, I would be a little more timid. I'd be closed off. I'd be a little more fearful. I feel the martial arts kind of woke me up. And I was training with you even as a kid doing the katas and, and the intense movements and pushing myself past, past physical bears as, as a young guy. But do you find that society kind of tim- makes us timid? What, what, I don't know how to word it, right? Do you, it slows us down, sheep mentality. Do you find that that's happening? Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, in, in our nature, the way that we learn, we, we learn by by observing and, and mimicking. Right. You know, so where are the leaders that are teaching us this, this, this movements and these things that we can mimic? You know, so as the teacher, the role of a teacher is very important in society. You know, and teachers, are, they don't get enough respect. But right. to be a teacher, you know, lots of teachers have to give up their own self-development in order to be a role model for others. You know, so as a teacher, you lose, you lose your technique. You know, you, I mean, you don't get to de- define your own technique. You get to, you have to always have to show everybody the technique that they need, right? But what about what you need? So right. as a, you know, so we, so in society, we need to, we have to, we have to get the teachers very, very knowledgeable, high level of knowledge where they can take the same knowledge and improvise it so it can go to each person the way that they need to get it. So everybody has a different way of learning. But there's only we always try to feed it to people in the same way to everybody where what we all need is individual teaching yeah you know teaching this tailored towards our own personalities because we are different psychologically you know we, have, we have, it's not that we're born so different but we get we have different experiences so we're you know depends on what kind of environment that we grew up in same thing same thing we're saying with the dogs <laughs> Right, yeah. so they're to fight. You know, it's the, it's the environment that we grow up in that defines us. So we have to um, factor that in when we're training people and teaching people, and when we're looking at the world as a whole. All right, let's. Let, I want to wrap this up again with fitness, real quick. Um, so you are obviously in great shape. It looks like you're in good shape. I see. I haven't. You don't post too much on Facebook, but you look like you're in good shape, lean and strong. So I remember you when I was like 11 years old. That was a long time ago. You still look the same, and I look like an old fart. So. I mean, how do you, how do you do it? Like, are you, are you having, are you alkalizing the body? Is it meditation? Is it breathing? Is it genetics? Like, what is it that, what's your, what's your secret, man? Like, can you tell us, is it like, how do you, do you meditate? Do you recommend meditation? Like, what are some secrets you could tell people uh, to to just get an overall better shape? I spent my whole life doing martial arts, like since I was 15, doing martial arts. So I found, uh, I found my passion early. I found something that I was good at that that I, I like to do. It wasn't work. It was just fun for me. Right. Then I then I made it my career, basically, and I kept doing it all the way through. So when I train people, I'm training myself too, and I work out with my people too. So I'm, I'm as they grow, I'm growing too. You know, see, people that teach something are the ones they need it more than the they're the ones that need it the most. The teachers that would need it the most. So I'm teaching. I'm living through my people that I teach. Right. So that's my whole goal. My whole goal is just to, to stay with it and stay and stay continuous and, and, and do it always. You know, and eating, I eat properly. You know, I try to eat, I try to eat properly, try to stay close to nature. When I go to the grocery store, I, I shop around the outside, the perimeter of the grocery store, instead of getting the stuff in the boxes with the codes on the inside, I go around the outside where the produce is. I go in the wow. produce section, you know, I try to get water. You're supposed to have eight glasses of water a day. I have trouble with that. But I try to be conscious and try to, you know, no pop, try to stay away from pop, try to herbal tea. Are you uh, meat eater? Are you meat eater? More veggies, uh, more meat, or what is it a good mix of? Is it a bit mix of both? 
I don't, I don't eat, you know what? I eat meat, I don't eat pork. Um, I eat, I love to eat seafood, I love fish. Um, potatoes, sweet potatoes, yam, yeah. rice and peas, you know, I eat traditional food. Uh, what else, vegetable, I love fruits. Right, it's hard to maintain favorite. though, because when I hit 30, like I just, I'm working out, like I, I'm wearing this watch here that kind of monitors me, gives me kind of like an optimal, optimal strain on my day. And I'm trying to push myself. It's kind of like my own coach here. I'm using this watch here. But I wanted to ask you, like, do you find that the metabolism definitely does slow down for you? For me, it's kicking my ass, but I'm still trying to maintain it. But it sits here on the stomach. For you, yeah. have you have you been able to fight that off? Or do you notice that it's trying yeah. to creep up on you? No, it's creeping up on me because my body doesn't, doesn't recover as quick and it, it doesn't react as quickly to when I work out. Right. doesn't react as quick to put on muscle to hold on to muscle it starts to want to my body wants to let go of muscle now so i'm trying to keep i'm trying to keep it on but what i did was because i've been training all my life in martial arts i have a base like i can kick i know how to kick i know how to punch right i, I was starting to get wise in my own eyes where i became my own trainer telling myself what to do then i realized that how am i teaching people telling them what to do and no one's telling me what to do right so I got to put myself under somebody so then they can tell me what to do as I tell other people what to do. So I got to put myself back in the loop, back in the chain. That's what I realized. Right. So what I did was I got myself two teachers. I joined the uh, Capoeira Angola, you know, Capoeira yeah. Angola. That's the original style of Capoeira that goes back all the way back from Africa to when the slavery, when they enslaved um, people from Africa. Right. And they and the, the Portuguese they brought them to Brazil and the Dutch brought them to Brazil and then they put the system they brought the system and they put it together and developed it and they use it to kick everybody's ass right and free themselves in Brazil so the Brazilians did and it's the original style Capoeira de Angola so I I, start, I put myself under a teacher in Toronto a teacher of Capoeira de Angola and um, he became my instructor so he teaches me and we have a mestre in brazil as well so let me try to understand this so this style was built because they the slaves wanted to free themselves am i saying this correct like they were in a situation where they were held as slaves and they designed a style to, to protect themselves is that what happened it came from africa angola it came from uh, angola oh, okay but it's designed yeah. to protect yourself to some degree obviously yeah. from from you know people that are trying to invade yes. your your space yeah yeah that's right it's an african fighting system <laughs> They made a movie about that, didn't they? Only the Strong. Is that designed around this style? And was it conveyed properly when they talked about it? You know, I never, I heard about it. I never really saw the movie. I never yeah, there's really a whole the whole song to it. I remember I'm a yeah. 90s kid. And they kept playing the movie. I think it's Only the Strong. It's kind of like, it's like a dancing style, right? Yeah, it's like a, it's, it's a it can be, yeah, it's a dancing style. That's right. That's right. It's a many, it's many, many things. So if you're a dancer, it's dancing. You know, if you're a musician, it's music. But if you're a fighter, it's fighting. And you can look at it and you can see it. And you can, there's lots, there's lots, lots to extract from it if you look at it properly. But it's um, war simulation. So lots of the moves are moves that you can use in combat and moves that they did use in combat and they're all effective and they work. It so flow, it flows, right? But it, but if I'm if I'm trying to attack you and you come at me with that style, is it kind of like I'm underestimating that you're gonna hit me? Is it because you don't look that intimidating if you're just moving like you're dancing, right? I don't feel that I'm gonna and then pop, you just crack him. Is yeah. that kind of is it made to kind of trick you a little bit? Yeah, it's like it's like a long version. It's like a long form of movement because we're playing. We play capoeira. Right. We're playing. But if you look at um like this, see I'm swing. But if yeah. you look at Floyd Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather does capoeira too, but he goes like this. Faster, yeah. Right. Right, but it's right. the same thing. It's just a different look of the same thing. Right, right. right. So now, but you can't, no one's, we're not all Floyd Mayweathers. We can't all practice like this. And, no. right? So we practice like this and we move, and we do our movements, right? But right. when you need it, you still have it. You can right? move quick, but you, yeah. But you exactly. don't do it all the time. So you stay in motion. So and, um, an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless um, an equal, what's it go? Yeah, I think unless I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know I've heard of it, yeah. Right, and that's another force um, pushes against it type of thing. So that's what we're doing. So we stay in motion, and it's difficult to track somebody. If someone's in motion, it's hard to track somebody. You have to predict where they're going to be, and right. you have to know where they're going to get to. So it's, it makes it, it, it. Who would you rather fight? Someone that's moving or someone that's stationary? Stationary looks like an easier target for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite person to fight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So there's so yeah, there's so much going on. So he, so my teacher took my, um, he took my my techniques that I already have and refined it 
and put it into the capoeira context. So now when I go to class, we're just moving all the time. We're doing all these movements, all these animal movements. Um, they're all attacks. Every move that we do is an attack in a way to take somebody out. Every single move. You know, he doesn't teach it like that. Right. But the deeper meaning behind the moves, there's a deeper meaning behind every move. So let me ask you this. I, I, I brought you on here. I promoted you as this amazing martial arts, which you are. You, you know, you've been at it for a long time. So they're, they're probably going to ask you, Joe, this guy is so good. Why isn't he in the UFC? What happened to you? Did you just not train for the UFC? Or was that like past, like, was it to the point where you're like, I don't want to do this? Was it just not your thing? Is it just, it was just too hard to get there? Why Great. did you never make a, like a, like a road towards the UFC? Why did you never make that approach? Yeah, I'm, I'm so old that when I started the UFC, I was already a black belt. Right. <laughs> when the UFC was started. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'd never seen, I'd never seen jujitsu. I'd heard about Gracie jujitsu, but I'd never seen it. I'd never seen a Gracie jujitsu practitioner. Wow. I'd read about it, but I'd never actually seen it. So my jujitsu game wasn't on point at the time. But when I saw it, I said, I want to learn this. So I started learning jujitsu. Right. right away, I went, I went, there was no jujitsu in Hamilton. So I went to the um, Japanese Cultural Center and I enrolled in judo. Oh, okay. Yeah, I trained with those guys for a bit. That was fun. That was fun. And then, um, and then um, we, you know, we were doing the stand-up fighting, and I kept watching the jujitsu guys, and they were the jujitsu guys were really good at the time. You know, they would have tapped us all out. I didn't have any defense <laughs> against that. But what happened was in the jujitsu club, um, in, in our club, people would come visit us, and they all knew a little bit of jujitsu, so they'd come and see me. Right. Right, so I met so many people that knew jujitsu and that we just do random grappling all the time. So I was like the defender of the club. Anyone that comes in, they have to fight me and see if they want to, you know, they want to see if they can beat, if they want to, you know, somebody new in a martial arts club that already trains, when they come to the club, they, you have to evaluate them and assess and see what they're all about. So they put me on that person. So I was just kind of the resident, you know, enforcer and people would come in and I'd have to grapple with them. And uh, nobody ever came in and beat me. <laughs> you could have actually made, didn't you have the contacts back in the 90s to make a call to UFC? You could have been the guy fighting the sumo wrestler. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you could have been the kickboxer in there fighting. The, you could have been in UFC 5, right? Technically, you had the skills. It didn't make sense to me because I always figured the jiu-jitsu guy would win. Right, right. Right, yeah. and I didn't have the jiu-jitsu. Like Jeff Joslin, he had the jiu-jitsu. He went and got the jiu-jitsu and... and and I, I, I competed against him in a tournament. And when I saw him fight in the UFC, I, I, I was so happy that they had a hard time with his jiu-jitsu too. I was like, yes. Yeah, I know yeah. they have a hard time with his jiu-jitsu because it's so good. Right, Maybe. so I know that it's a jiu-jitsu element. We didn't have any jiu-jitsu to go to. There's nobody teaching it. Jeff was the first one teaching it in right. Hamilton. Right, yeah. right. There was nowhere to go. All right, man. I hope I, I hope I put, oh, I got to push you. I got to, I, I've got to push everybody here uh, a little bit. That's the whole show. So if I were to give you an option now, we're talking about health and fitness. You got to be, you got to walk around at 350 pounds. You got to be a little bit obese, right? You got to, that's the, that's the whole thing. And you got to stay like that for 10 years, but I gave you $10 million, but you got to stay like that. Or would you rather live an average life? Let's say make 50 to hundred grand. Just, to, just I'm, I'm not saying that's what you make. I'm just saying I'm throwing out a number there. Let's just say you made 150 to hundred grand, lived a comfortable life, but we're the shape that you're in, but, or you can be obese for, for 10 years, but you get all the money in the world, but you got to stay like that. Would you choose money or this lifestyle? I know it's, I kind of know the answer, but I'm just curious your thoughts on this. Wait, so what are my options here? <laughs> your options are 380 pounds overweight, and you got to maintain that, eat potato chips, chill out, watch TV, do nothing, catch, but you get all the money, you get $10 million cash. You get to do whatever you want. For 10 years, you got to stay like that, or do you keep maintaining the life you have, and, and we're going to give you a 50, 50, grand, 50 grand a year, 50 to 100 grand. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I know, um, I'm pushing you. For 10 years, I got to be 350 pounds for 10 years? Yeah. And you gotta eat, you can't work out. You just gotta eat potato chips all day and just chill. No, it's not sustainable. I don't think you could, you could, you, <laughs> it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Give me all the money up, for, up front. So you consider it. You actually <laughs> sit on the couch for 10 years. That would be tough to do. No, that'd be impossible. I'm just joking. I would never, that'd be impossible because between 350 pounds, no exercise, you no. would not last for 10 years. You'd last for, you would last for less than one year. 
<laughs> you got all the money in the world. They'll stick you with IVs and make sure that your vitals are moving properly, you know, right? That's why I say, give me all the money up front. So if I'm going to go out, <laughs> at least I'm going to go out with all the money in the bank. Right? <laughs> all right. I thought I'd have some fun here at the end of the show here. So yeah, definitely, guys. There you go. Health above all, guys. That's what it is. Health above all. So, so Lee, thanks. Appreciate it, man. Lee Turner, guys. Uh, we're going to link below. I think you got a website. We'll, we'll link your contact information below, whatever you provide me with. If you want us to shout any of your stuff out, it is below here. If you want to get in touch, maybe whatever you want to provide for me, we'll link, link it below. And uh, the Joe Camo Show, first episode, episode one. Lee, it's been a pleasure, man. It was, I'm glad that I started off with you. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Joe. I had a great time. Good seeing you again, brother. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. All right. Blessings.